Okay, guys, so we are back for the replay. Uh, if you have not seen it, this is the switch game or flip game of Operation Sea Wolf. This one is going to be called Operation Sea Dogs. And in this scenario, the Japanese are going to be hunting the British, the HMS Hood, in fact. So basically, the Hood having performed admirably well in the action against the Japanese gun, the Japanese have gotten word that the Hood is now heading back to England and they are going to try to destroy it before it can get off of the map. Everything is the same in the last scenario. The Hood has eight turns to get off. The Japanese basically have subs. They can only win a victory if the hood is destroyed at the end of eight turns. The allies can win a partial victory if they destroy all the Japanese subs. Now, the biggest difference, and I noticed, and I tried to correct this as much as possible, is the Japanese subs are a lot more potent than the British subs in this, in this game. So a few of them have special characteristics like finish them off which gives them an extra dice when a sub is wounded. They have another one, I believe, called, uh, is it a long shot that allows them to a uh, roll extra dice. And I tried to get rid of most of that, but in general, the Japanese just have better subs at this point in the war, I guess, than, than the British had. And so that is going to make it very difficult for the uh, hood. The hood is going to have some uh, some uh, planes that have depth charges. These are going to be swordfish. In the other game, if you did not watch, the uh, Germans had condors. They will get a Catalina. So instead of rolling for the uh, S-boat to come on like we did for the Germans, we will roll for the Catalina. But because it doesn't have to get a rearm token, uh, it can come back every turn. So it will effectively be, actually it will probably be better than the boat because it can simply be placed. Although the Japanese will have fighters, they will have uh, some Zeeks as well as a 201CB. I think this is an Italian fighter because obviously, I mean, interestingly enough, they lost a lot of their fighters in that campaign uh, over the island. So they had to... Uh, borrow some uh, stuff from the Italians. So other than that, just to kind of show you the difference, I'm going to get set up and we're going to get right into turn one. Okay, so we are beginning turn one. We're going to get right into it, rolling for initiative. The Japanese get plus one for winning the last scenario. Maybe I should call them the Axis. The Americans, though, get plus one because the hood is a flagship. So the Americans win the initiative which will cause the Japanese to have to move first. I think all of their subs only have a speed of one, which is going to be important. And these subs are actually going to try to learn from the last game and try to outflank or cut off the, uh, the hood before it can get to one of the... Uh, if you can see up there, one of the causeways or one of the sea lanes and get away. But the hood now moves second. The commander can obviously get an idea that the Japanese are going to try to bring their subs in there and intercept him if he goes that way. So he is going to go one, two. So I think these subs here will still be able to get a shot at them, but these subs, I think, will be out of range. One, two, three. Although most Japanese subs, I noticed, actually had a range of three. Unlike the, uh, the truculence that I had in the last game for the Brits. So that could be a huge factor in this game. All right, let's get to the air placement. The Japanese have to place first, so they have their Zeke fighters. I think they're going to obviously send one here. The Americans can now, or the uh, British can now bring on their swordfish. <clears throat> so they will bring a dive, I mean a uh, depth charge with swordfish there. 
The Japanese can now bring a fighter there, which I think that is the uh, the Italian. The British have another swordfish, which they are going to bring here as well, since there's only one fighter there. The Catalina will not come into play this turn uh, because we will start rolling for that next turn. So to give you guys an idea, we are pretty much focusing our attention down here at the moment. And the main thing we want to try to get an idea of is how is this air defense phase going to play out. So let's get right into it. This fighter basically has nothing that it can do. It's obviously because they had to go first. Uh, that has hurt them. Now, this fighter, which is, I believe those are the 201-2001CB. It has seven dice. So it is going to try to shoot off one of the swordfishes. Well, let's see what it does with seven dice. Three, six, seven dice. So it's got one, two, three, three hits. A six is two hits. That's four hits, which I think will be enough to abort one of the swordfishes. Their armor is only three. They only have one hall point. Their vital armor is six. So four hits is actually enough to do one point of damage. And I think it would actually... Uh, destroy it it has one point of damage it only has one hall point the armor is three wow i think that that does it well i don't know why it has a vital armor of six and armor of three but only one hall point. because anytime obviously if it's armor is three and you have one hall point your vital armor should be should be three as well so let me check that because that's a little confusing uh, just to show you the card I'm looking at says it has an armor of three. So they got four hits, which means I know they got through their armor, which would normally be one point of damage and would normally uh, abort it. But I don't know what the vital armor means, so I want to double check that. Okay, so I clarified that. So basically aircraft do not have haul points. If you roll equal to or over they, their armor, they're simply aborted. You must roll over their vital armor to destroy them. So they don't keep track of damage. They're either aborted or destroyed. So this was aborted. These uh, swordfish were aborted, but they were not destroyed because they did not equal the vital armor. And I think that's all the air defense that we have. Let me see if the hood has any extended air defense. No, it has extended range, fatal flaw. Uh, it does have uh, torpedoes, but they can't be used against subs. So that is all the air defense. The air attacks will now come in. We have the swordfish on the submarines. The swordfish has three depth charges. Uh, see if they have any specials. It talks about hitting a battleship. They're not going after a battleship. So they have three depth charges, and let's see which one of these they're going to target because they have different, these are all different abilities. So that is an I-26, which I think he may want to target that one. The I-26 has uh, Infiltrator, which I didn't use in this game because it's not part of the scenario. It does have range of three. Uh, if you guys want to see what I'm looking at, so that is the I-26. I think the other one is an I-19, which is probably an inferior sub. Let's take a look at it. So the I-19 has range 3 as well. Submerge shot. Finish him off. I don't like that. So we're going to target the I-19. has an armor of 3. So we need to at least get three hits on it. Looking for at least one six. 
So we got a six and a five, which is three hits, which is exactly what we needed to put damage on the I-19. The I-19 has two haul points, so it is now damaged to half its uh, haul. Unfortunately, subs only move one. So it won't affect its movement, but we will see uh, if it affects anything else. Because that was that was actually a big, big difference, unlike the last game where the planes were basically wholly ineffective. Okay, so we're going to come back after that with obviously the uh, torpedo attacks. Okay, so I did double check on the uh, crippled status. It will receive a minus one to its armor and uh, I believe its other uh, its speed rating, although the minimum is one. It actually receives one less die, but it still does get a minimum of one. So like on that long range shot with one die, it will still get its one die. But it gets a minus one to its armor, vital armor, and speed ratings. Another thing I did not realize is if a capital ship gets crippled, it actually loses its flagship status, which is important for initiative. So we are going to roll. Let's see, first of all, with these two here, they have one, two, and then one, two. So let's see what subs they are that are attacking the hood. The first is... Uh, let's see what that one is. That is an I-25. And so if we look at the I-25 at a range of two, it is going to get to roll two dice. It is going to need sixes. So we will see. Well, that one went off the table. That was a three. And that was a three. So it did not it did not do any damage. We have another sub over there by it, which I believe is the uh, Italian Ambra. This at a range of two only rolls one die, and it is not attacking a destroyer, so the special ability will not count. And it rolled a four, so the hood is holding up. Now we have these here. This one is one, two, three. That is the I-26. At three, it rolls one die. Let's see. And it rolled a three. So that did not have any effect. The crippled ship at three rolls one die. And again, it will still get its one die. And it rolled a four. So all of those torpedoes that were directed at the hood missed. And the hood is still in play and still uh, moving forward. So that is pretty much going to end this turn. The planes are going to return. They will not be back next turn. But we will roll at the beginning of next turn to see if uh, the hood gets the Catalina. Okay, we are back, and pretty much just like we saw in uh, the first game, the uh, hood is beginning to pull away. They were not able to damage it. That first turn is huge for these sub hunters coming from behind. Uh, they, the uh, Japanese won the initiative, so they required the hood to move first. It moved up two. They all moved up one which that is as close as they can get. The difference though is these Japanese subs do have a range of three. Even though they're not very effective that far out, uh, they have a range of three. So they might still get some shots off, which is not, which was not possible last turn. So we are gonna roll to see if the uh, Catalina comes on. This is turn two, so it will come on on a roll of a one or a two. Oh, we rode a one. We rode a one. So it will come on. We do not have to roll for where it comes on because it is a plane. We are going to see where it is going to go. So what we're going to look at what sub has the best shot at range three. If it doesn't have range three, we're not even going to worry about it. Uh, the Catalina actually has three depth charges. 
let's see if it has any specials. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, it says shadowing. At the beginning of your air attack step, you may choose an enemy ship within range two. Your aircraft roll one extra attack die when attacking that ship this turn. So I don't know what that means right within at the beginning of your air attack step within range two. So I guess they could we could get an extra die, but that would only be against the plane. We're going to go back there because at, at this point, the best we can do is attack this sub again and try to eliminate it. They're both going to get one die off, so it really doesn't make much of a difference. But that I-19 has that finish off ability which would allow it to roll uh, one extra die when attacking damaged ships. And that would actually still be in effect if somehow the hood got damaged. Other than that, none of them can roll air defense. So we are going to go, the uh, Catalina is going to press in with its depth charges. So it got a six, which is two. Now, this is significant because normally two would not be enough to get through the armor. But because the I-19 has a critical on it, a two will equal its armor. And a two will do another point of damage to it, which in this case will destroy the Catalina. So the Catalina is gone. It is came off the map. It has been depth charged and it has been taken off the map. So that is a nice little point scored for the allies. So we're going to take the I-19 off. That was actually one of the most dangerous subs that they had hunting the uh, hood. Now, other than that, there's nothing else that uh, anybody can do. But these subs, if they have a range of three, can do an attack. The Amber does not have a range of three. The I-25 rolls one die at three. So let's make sure that's what this is. Eight of eight. So that is the, yep, that is the I-25. So it does get one torpedo shot and it definitely needs a hit. And it only rolled a three. Now, I don't know if this one is within three anymore or not. One, two, three, four, because it was within three of last time. It no longer is. And that is all they will be able to do. And the hood is very close to exiting the map. And the U.S. needs this because last time the Japanese or the Axis picked up a quick 200 VPs because the VPs are starting to increase. So the U.S. cannot afford to lose this. Okay, we're going to roll for initiative for turn three. And the U.S. wins initiative. They get a plus one. So that gives them a six, which means the Japanese will have to move first. They're, they really have no choice, you know, but to try to close that gap, which I don't really think they're going to have much success with that. The hood will now move one, two, because it is not damaged. So it is outrunning those subs by a bit now. I don't even think any of them can get a shot. So now this is going to be interesting because remember last game I told you that the uh, that the uh, uh, the shorn horse could have sat there and tried to finish off uh, the subs in order to uh, get a partial victory. Although in this case you're going they're going to get the total victory for getting off. So I guess it really wouldn't matter. Uh, I'm even. Go I'm gonna see if I even need to bring the planes out though, because at this point, one, two, wait, one, two, three. So none of these can get a shot on this ship. They can't catch it either. Even if this gets damaged, it will probably get off next turn. I mean, I could bring the planes out and see, but. You know, it's not even damaged. So there you go. I think I'm going to call this scenario as well. And the reason I'm going to call it is because they, they can't catch the hood at this point. The hood is undamaged. It will get off the map. Uh, 
So these are it was these were some very interesting scenarios. I think, like I said, if I was to replay these, I would have the subs coming in the map from the other direction, and in that way, we would have had a little more of a cat and mouse because what you would imagine is you'd have the hood coming in from here, you know, maybe these subs back there, and so now you've got the hood that has the speed going one two. These subs are going one. Right, and then the hood might go say one, two, and these subs would go one, right? And you're 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 setting up for maybe a big turn where the hood has to try to break through. So I may try that later, maybe towards the end of the campaign. Uh you know, as the Japanese uh maybe might want some last ditch, you know, damage to the US forces. Uh but right now this is going to be an Allied victory. Which is essentially going to even things back up. Each side picked up a quick 200 VPs. So they should be able to bring back a lot of their ships that were destroyed. Or, you know, they can hold on to them, you know, and try to hit the 1,000 point VPs. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I wanted to put these both together. And I'll uh, just show you how you can play some very quick scenarios with, with Axis and Allies miniatures. This was very quick. In fact, I'm probably going to leave this up and do the next scenario and then uh, film that and put that up next week. Take care guys, God bless. Mm -hmm.